Hello everybody, today I'm gonna to check out Marshall Jilk's new album, Waiting to Continue. I'm going to listen through and uh, give you some ideas as I go, but then we're gonna chat with Marshall himself later on, uh, so let's get to it. It's the Marshall Jilk's trio, so it's trombone, bass, and drums. Yasushi Nakamura is playing bass and Clarence Penn is playing drums. Marshall Jilks, waiting to continue. Alternate side records. <laughs> Goosebumps already, come on. Mm. Yeah. You know, I I'm not a jazz musician. I, I went to school for classical music, so I, I have a pretty big like uh, imposter syndrome when I listen to jazz, when I play jazz, all of it. I'm pretty fearless in it, and I'll do it anyway, but I definitely feel like I'm out of my element. And so when I'm talking about this, I have to talk to it from a perspective that isn't, oh, I see what you're doing there. I understand exactly um, like the, the content matter or the quoting or any of it. However, it does feel like he's uh, using a very classical kind of vocabulary throughout this solo specifically, which is great, obviously, starting with that uh, chorale. The way he's playing these lines that you could hear in any etude. Or do we go back into the chorale? There's nothing better. You can't convince me otherwise. The mix of this is really good. The panning makes you feel like you're, you're kind of there. Not looking at them from the front, but surrounded by them. It's really nice. That's that's an awesome way to open an album. I love how settled it gets during this melody. A lot of the times you'll hear soloists that will play something very musically. The intent of the music is super clear, uh, but it's very basic. And that's kind of hopefully my style. Like hopefully that's what I try to do in my solos is like, don't play a million notes, just play a beautiful melody. It's cool to hear him be able to do both, like playing a beautiful melody, but it's using this wide range of techniques. Nobody plays a, a sweet melody better than Marshall.
again, there's nothing better than a Marshall Jokes chorale. I'm sorry, I would listen to an entire album of those. Right? Come on. I want it to go, and it doesn't. It has all of these melodic and chordal things that are so unexpected, you know? They, they go places that your ear thinks it'll go some other place uh constantly throughout a very short tune that's really beautiful you know it's not like the it's particularly dissonant or um ugly or anything it's it's beautiful the whole way through it's just going places that you don't expect very cool That's a man with valves for a slide. That's crazy. First thing I I was wondering about, thanks for doing this, by the way. (laughs) I guess my first question, what did you write about before you had kids? (laughs) Oh, that's a good question. (laughs) You know, I I think some some of my earliest compositions, I don't know if they were really consciously about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm sure there, there obviously were inspirations for them, but I don't know if I was so maybe tuned into that or... I, mean, I, I guess there are definitely cases where I say I'm going to write a tune about my son or my daughter, mm-hmm. you know, um, or there's one on this record about my wife as well. So I guess in the previous record, I already had kids too. So there's, there's some pieces on that, but there's also a piece on the last record that was inspired by a trip to, uh, to Denali National Park mm. in uh, Alaska. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a piece called the Denali Suite. So it's for big bands, so it's quite a different format than this newest record. But uh, there's a piece I've dedicated to my, my grandfather. Mm on one and a piece I wrote for my mom. <laughs> I guess a lot of them are about people yeah. lately, last uh, couple of few records, but. Uh, so the process of actually recording this album, I understand was diff- different. First of all, when you walk into the studio, they had a digital thermometer, <laughs> you know, so they took your temperature before you came in every day. They said not more than one client in the control room for longer than 10 minutes at a time. Okay. Um, so what I said, I, well, why don't you guys just set up monitors in the main room? Mm-hmm. And so we had monitors there. And so actually none of us ever, ever set foot in the, in the, uh, in the control room, the entire session. Gotcha. Two days. Yeah. Hmm. And, um, and I, you know, there was, they said, you know, no communal meals. Mm -hmm. So I kind of made some like grab bags for the guys Hmm. and I was making sandwiches (laughs) in the morning of each session, you know? And also, I mean, I, I, we could have taken a video team in or a photographer, but you know, given the circumstances, I just thought, you know, Mm -hmm. the fewer the bodies, the better. So. And I was really nervous about going into to record because I thought, oh, you know, you know, I've been practicing a lot still and mm-hmm. I've, been, I've been pretty inspired. Um, but um, but yeah, that's definitely <laughs> in my back of my mind. I was thinking like, oh, man, it's, you know, and, and actually it was crazy from the very first the very first take. The f- very first song we did was the tune um, Longing for Home. Mm-hmm. And we could have used the first take. It, really? it, it, it was funny. When we started playing, it just felt great. It was like I think everybody just felt like, ah, oh. mm mm-hmm. It's just so nice to play with people again, you know? Uh, how do you know the, the other two guys? So the bass player, Yasushi Nakamura, and I, we went to Juilliard together. Okay. Um, so we were in the jazz program at Juilliard. And uh, um, and Clarence, um, I met playing with the Maria Schneider Orchestra. He played drums with Maria Schneider's orchestra for a lot of many years. Yasushi and Clarence both played on my second album. Oh, okay. Later, a record called Lost Words. It's a quintet record, so it also has piano um, and trumpet on it. How much have you done with a with a trio like this, with no chordal instrument and just just bass? 
Uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the I always liked playing um, playing in that format. Um, I, I think the first trio setting I ever played in um, uh, was like my second year of college, and um, I was I was I really used to like the Paul Motion trio back then, hmm. uh, the drummer, and it was but that was a different that was that's not a chordless trio, it's a bassless trio. I always really liked some, especially saxophone trio recordings, Joe Henderson. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's live at the Village Vanguard records I used to listen to a ton, and so I was like that. Uh, also, Joshua Redman's trio, mm. um, it's a, you know. Um, and so, um, and actually, the first time I ever played at the International Trombone Festival, I brought a trio from New York. So we, that's back, probably back in two thousand nine, mm -hmm. two thousand eight, in Salt Lake City. It's kind of kind of my favorite format to play in. Maybe it's, it feels a little more intimate with the other musicians that way, you know, in terms of sure. you know being able to communicate and definitely more intimate also a lot more work <laughs> yeah it's it's physically pretty physically demanding as a trombone player to do it yeah yeah what was the in recording this album how many days were you in the studio how many tunes would you do in a day we did two days probably the first day was maybe a little shorter day maybe first day might have been a seven hour day but we definitely, I, I took, you know, it's good to be in charge if you're, if you're doing a trombone <laughs> record, we took, took our time, you know, yeah, you know, if we, if we sure. needed breaks and stuff. And, um, it was, um, pretty relaxed, but yeah, we did two days. The second day was probably more like an eight or nine hour session. Mm -hmm. uh, but with a lot of, like a lot of breaks and mm -hmm. stuff and a lot of listening back, um, there were some tunes, maybe one or one or two, we may have only done one take of really even because I, you know, knowing how much work there was and how much music to get through. Yeah. You know, if it was a really good take, I might have just said, okay, yeah, let's, you... let's move on. On waiting to continue, I, I think I kind of wanted, I, I don't know, I, I kind of almost like felt like starting the record with some kind of hymn, mm -hmm. brass, brass hymn. And, you know, I don't know, there's something about brass and and brass choirs, whether it be a trombone choir or a full brass choir, but just this the sound of that that I think is somewhat a very soothing thing. Yeah. And so I think given kind of the um the the you know the circumstances and the, the nature of the situation, like I I just felt like kind of like almost trying to start the record with some kind of hymn or prayer kind of feeling, you know. Yeah. You know, I wrote the the main the main body of the tune first and then I and then I decided I wanted to kind of write these these this chorale mm -hmm. um, kind of introduction and um, sorry the piano the piano tuner hasn't been here in a while. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> but um and just when I started writing the chorale I was just trying to take elements from that melody to base the chorale off of so You know, mm -hmm. experimenting like that. So that's where the, the you know the first two notes from the actual melody of the tune is what I started to growl off. It's a gorgeous way to start the album. Uh, oh, thanks. And that that so that's all multi tracked then. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. I did that. Um, yeah, I just made a, I programmed a little click. That's good. What's the other one with the with the multi track? Is it Anya's? Uh, it's called Anya's tune. Yeah. yeah, we you know we rehearsed it, and it's it's pretty harmonically dense. Um, Very much. And so. Um, I, part of me maybe was afraid in the in the, uh, in the particularly in the melody sections with, with in a chordless trio of, of the of all the, the harmonies really being conveyed properly. So uh, that's kind of what first what first made me think about that. But then I just started messing around. I was like, oh, this is going to sound nice. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to sound nice with trombones. You know, you know, I had done you know home recording stuff. I mean, obviously recording tracks for people a lot in the past. But I, I had never really, except for just messing around, never really. Um, ever took it to a level like you do? <laughs> so it was a bit of a learning process. Yeah. What was uh, your? I, I probably uh, should. I probably would have saved a lot of time if I if I if I sent you a message, asked for some help. <laughs> it's like knowing your note in the chord. Like if I'm sure, playing yeah, a third yeah. of a, a chord, but the chord's not there yet. Yeah. No. It's it's like playing with other people, and that's one big thing I've been having my some of my students do. I've been having them every week. They have to send me a Bach trio. Mm with and all the parts in there they're all learning a lot about their own intonation <laughs> you learn a lot real fast yeah, yeah. what's what's this is it the usual where the tempo is set by the performer yeah yeah that's a that cool gets, a cool thought it gets the warp a little bit like minor warp speed <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh is that an older tune then that you guys have played together that's an older tune yeah um you know i i kept on always 
You know, I think I was uh, oftentimes in solos, always hearing that same kind of sure uh, descending whole step thing. Yeah, idea, and uh, so I just decided to write a tune about it called "The Usual." <laughs> the, I see. It's yeah, like yeah. the the lick, but that's yeah, yeah. The, yeah my my the lick. Yeah. yeah. So for the, the new normal track, knowing that this is the track that was written during the pandemic, and like, is there a representation of anything real in this, or even in your solo? Like, is your solo inspired? by the times or is it just inspired by the tune you know i mean i, I guess probably the more of the headspace that i was in when i wrote it versus writing a lot of the other stuff you know mm -hmm. um and that's probably maybe the most harmonically dense tune on the record as well you know um so um i mean to be honest when i'm soloing i'm, I'm trying to i was probably just trying to be as musical as possible but also trying to play the change because it's really harmonically <laughs> you know um um but it, i i guess but I guess they're probably definitely is it, when I was writing it. I mean, you know, it starts in whatever C minor, so. So it's, you know, starts in a darker key and then goes to the, the, re the relative major, which is maybe more of like a hopeful mm -hmm. message, I guess, in the tune or whatever, but. But, you know, ultimately the vamp that it starts, you know, these descending. Uh... These descending, you know, chords like that, I, that, that definitely has a little bit more uncertainty, I would say, to it. So the, the tune starts with that and ends with that. So I mm -hmm. guess if I really were to think about it, what was I thinking about when coming up with those? I guess that would be the best. Uh, Describe. When folks are learning how to improvise, right? They're they're obviously doing the transcriptions, they're doing all of that stuff, but there's this headspace of I have to play the coolest, most impressive stuff that I've ever played every time I pick mm -hmm. up the horn, right? And it it's interesting to hear you play stuff that is impressive and high, but it never feels like that's the reason. It always feels like there's an intent musically. Did you have that transition? I mean, I assume when you started playing, there was that that same thing that happens to, to most people, which is, oh, I have to be impressive when I play. Like, when did that transition happen for you? And, and what was that? Um, wow, that's a, that's a great question. So first of all, the thing you said, I think is absolutely true. And maybe something that like deters a lot of people from wanting to get more deeper into improvisation and mm -hmm. jazz, you know, and I, I don't know exactly where that's that stuff comes from, but maybe somewhat from insecurity, you know, yeah. um, uh, not that I'm not a, not a psycho not a jazz psychologist, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I remember um, there was a uh, another student at Interlochen, uh, and you know this was you know I'm like 16 years old, you know, <laughs> and so he's you know I remember him in, using this term. This guy was an incredible piano player, you know, but I remember him talking, oh that guy, that guy's that guy's really harmonically advanced, you know, like, uh, like oh harmonically advanced, oh, and I'm thinking. Man, I got to get harmonically advanced. Yeah, man. I'm not harmonically <laughs> advanced. You know, so no. and I, I, I don't know what that means, but I need to become that. You know, yeah. <laughs> but but that you know, and I'm sure he did. He was you know an exceptional musician, but but that you know creating that feeling with oh, oh I'm not I'm not I'm not playing hip enough mm -hmm. stuff. I I do always mention like I got Maria Schneider's very first record called Evanescence when I was um, uh, my first year of college, mm -hmm. especially a piece on there called Greenpeace. Which I mean, if you look at the score to it, it's it's you know it's incredibly complex, but it's just but when it, it, it doesn't sound complex if you're listening to, at least to me at the time, and it was just and it's something about that record and her music I, I think kind of made me at least start to feel like oh what I what I like or what melodies I like or want that I want to write or listen to are okay and it's not you know it's like it's okay to be yourself you know mm -hmm. um and i think i think so many people are so worried about either writing something that's comp you know hip enough or har harmonically advanced enough or rhythmically advanced enough or whatever and then the same goes for improvisation oh i have to play this substitution or i have to do this or play this high note you know i, I when i practice working on my upper register i'm not like a lot of the reasoning behind that what came from I, I really like sax uh, saxophone player like Mark Turner is his name and he has this incredible altissimo but he plays these beautiful lines up and then comes back down right and so you know like if you looked at my music stand back here it's you know full of classical etudes so I don't know if you can see it but here's 
Strasbourg, Telemann. Oh, there you go. And in particular, in particular, these like the melodious etudes. And mm-hmm. nowadays, if I'm preparing for a big performance or a record book two, um, I really make sure I practice those um, hmm. where they're written down an octave and like you know every classical teacher probably tells their students and then in tenor clef um in my case i think i always wanted to be able to play you know guitar player and and saxophone lines and be able to get up there on the trombone and and keep the sound even and come back down so what's next for you (laughs) yeah i've started messing around with some different ideas i'm trying to get my trigger range a little more solid lately so i'm Hmm. practicing my big horn a lot i I just wanted to be a little more agile more for classical stuff you know working on yeah no, yeah. I all I'm hearing is is y- you're practicing and that scares me. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember hearing Archie's theme at ITF. It must have been 2016. Uh, you played in New York one. City. Yeah. yeah, was it completed or was it still just kind of an idea? Like, what? How different was that performance versus the one on the album? Uh pretty different. Yeah. I mean, that the, that one there was a solo. I just played solo, right? Oh yeah, that's uh, right. It was yeah. Just solo. So I, I I wrote that too, knowing I was gonna play it there, um, and um, my wife was pregnant with my son at the time, mm-hmm. and so my wife. Uh, I hope I'm sorry if anybody named Archibald is is uh, tuning in. <laughs> my wife's from Budapest, from Hungary, and she asked me, you know, she said, "What what's a typical American name?" And I was like, Archibald. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we kind of jokingly, you know, when she was pregnant, referred to him as Archie, you know. Um, and so, uh, and I guess in my mind, I had this idea of this, like, just, you know, hip, hip little baby coming out and just like with a strut and, you know, yeah, I wrote that originally for that. And then, you know, I maybe had played, played, played it a few times over the last few years. And then, you know, I kind of, um, I, you know, I just, yes, yeah, I thought, oh, this will work. This will work well with a trio. Let me see if I can, you know, so I made a, a couple little changes, but mainly just extra bar added here or mm-hmm. there. Uh, maybe one slightly different little section in it, but uh, but yeah, the basic, basically the body and the harmony of the tune is the same, you know. I'll see if I can find. Uh, I I have a recording of the the 2016 one. I'll, I'll see if Ooh. I can find. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll see if we can play a little bit of it. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, That'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah. favorite track on here is just a, a tune called the nod yeah uh, just because the of the way the band starts with the bass the bass yeah yeah, yeah that's a cool yeah. track yeah it originally <laughs> the, 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 the like that's the tune I, I didn't have a title yet i just wrote i always i started off with that i, I like that bass line you know uh, barely play it with my hand but so i was like i asked i, I sent it to yasushi i sent him a voice mess voice memo like hey man can, can you play this <laughs> and he's like yeah i'll get it you know? <laughs> um something about i think the way the band plays on that one it's just because this also has a lot of harmony in, mm-hmm. and just the way yasushi dictates the harmony throughout and just kind of the overall intensity of the band and the shape of the piece i I think that's probably my favorite track on the record well thanks for doing this this was awesome thanks for asking me chris man yeah Appreciate it. so where can they find the album and everything uh you can get it through my website or you can find it on bandcamp or you can find it on amazon or yeah you know it- if you want to stream it you can find it on apple music spotify pretty much everywhere so uh buy it on bandcamp and then stream it on spotify right there you go yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. all right thanks again yeah thanks chris thanks for watching if you like this format Uh, I did another one of these with Dr. Reginald Chapman uh, and his album Prototype. I'll put a link to that in the description. Uh, Thanks again to Marshall Jilks for doing this interview and uh, making this awesome album. If you want to check it out, uh, again, it's on all of the things. I recommend supporting him on Bandcamp, uh, where he gets most of the profits. And then if you want to stream it on Spotify and all that, do that. But support your artists uh, for making this great stuff. So, uh, waiting to continue. I'll put links to all of that in the description. Other than that, thank you to the Patreon donors for making all of these videos possible. 
you want to help out as well, you could go to patreon.com slash classical trombone. I uh, can't do any of this without you, so uh, thank you all. Uh, if we're talking about albums, we might as well talk about mine. Do I have one around here? Hold on. I got it. If you want to hear some of my own music after you're done listening to Waiting to Continue, you can check out my album. It's called Half Man, Half Machine. It's on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. And that sounds a little something like...